Well, I'm reminded of the lawyer that was driving through Dunellen. The lawyer came to a stop sign and rolled through it. And a police officer saw him. Police officer pulls up behind the lawyer. Officer walks up to the car and says, excuse me, sir, you just ran that stop sign. And the lawyer said, well, no, I didn't. I, I rolled through it slowly. Stopping and slowing down are the same thing. Oh, the police officer said, okay, sir, would you please get out the vehicle? The lawyer got out the vehicle. The police officer took out his baton and began to beat the lawyer. And I mean beat him. And finally, after a couple minutes, the police officer hollered out, Now, sir, would you like me to stop or just slow down? <laughs> I promised we were not going to pick on blonde heads or women today, so we went with lawyers. <laughs> Where's Crystal at? Oh, yeah, that was all Crystal Dateliff's idea and her fault. <laughs> Got a one-sentence sermon for you this morning, and that's this right here. Those who are victorious get to sleep till noon. How many of you enjoy sleeping till noon? And you get to eat gummy worms all day long. How many of you like gummy worms? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, some of you feel about the way I do about gummy worms. But I'm trying to relate to some of you. And those who are victorious will inherit the earth. And here's why. Because Christ's kingdom will reign forever. There is only one way to live this life. And that is through and with Jesus Christ at the helm, at the steering wheel, in the lead of your life. Because at the end, the only thing that's going to be left is Jesus Christ, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and those who have called out to his name to be saved. And everything else is going to pass away. A friend of mine I went to Bible college with is here this morning. His name is Justin Samuels. He's been a good friend of mine for a number of years. And uh, he brought his children with him on this visit. And last night we were talking around the dinner table. And I asked anybody who is listening, which rarely happens in my house, listen to me. I said, does anybody have a word from the Lord? And so one of them spoke up. Her name is Miss Molly Samuels. Come and join me, please, real quick. So Miss Molly Samuels has a word from the Lord. And when she was telling me about this word from the Lord, it's her word for the whole year. And so you know Pastor Tracy, Pastor Jen, Miss Christine, they come up with these words for the whole year. They're much braver than I am. I don't come up with a word for the whole year. No, because then you get challenged all year long. <laughs> Just being real honest with you. But this one right here has the guts enough to hear from God and is being challenged by this word. And I thought it would be a great way to start this morning's message. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Molly, as he said. Um, I've known Tom my whole life. So um, it's really special to be here um, to speak about a little part of my testimony. Um, the word is intentional. Um, that's my word for the year. And it really goes into my life in all aspects. Um, relationships, school, Anything that's important, um, I've decided to be intentional. And most importantly, my walk with the Lord. Um, a verse that um, I think the Lord gave me to sort of <clears throat> encourage me every day um, is Luke 9, um, verse 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Um, the, the daily is the key word there for me. Um, it's a daily commitment, a daily act of being intentional with, uh, with Christ. Um, and I think from that standpoint, it flows into every other aspect of my life. So thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Give me five. Good job. Thank you, Molly, for sharing this morning. And so at the end of it all, say end of it all. At the end of it all, you and I are going to be face to face with Jesus Christ. Just us and him for a few moments. And it's going to be very important that we were intentional in this life. I've been talking to you for the last couple of weeks from the book of Revelation. Okay? In case you're still not familiar with how to say it, you got to say Revelation. Twist your lip a little bit. 
Get a little snarl going, and that's how you say revelation. For, <laughs> for the last couple weeks, and even in the last year, we've been talking revelation and prophecies. This morning, I want to take you through revelation a little bit. I want to give you a big picture. Then I want to take you to chapter 11. Say chapter 11. Chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11. And so we're going to talk about that for a little bit. But before we do, Miss Olivia Bittinger is on our media today. Thank you very much, Miss Olivia, for helping us out. Kane Bald Dale is on our sound. Mr. Nate Bittinger is running our camera today. So God bless you all for helping us out. Miss Olivia, show us that first slide, sister girl. So God's kingdom will never end. Say never end. His kingdom will never end. Daniel chapter 2 says this, a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Jan Daniel chapter 7 says his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, when you were growing up, how many of your parents had to tell you uh, things over and over and over? Yeah, not me. My parents are here today. They only ever had to tell me one time, and I, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to point them out to you because I don't want you to know who they are because then you'll go ask them if I'm telling you the truth or not. Luke chapter 131 says this, his kingdom will never end. Now that's a super cool scripture because an angel tells Mary that the baby she's about to have, his kingdom is never going to end. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 says he will reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5 says, and they say they, now say me. I will reign forever and ever. Why? Because when you are Jesus's, he is yours. And when he reigns, you reign, baby. The next slide we want to show you is the tribulation period is a fight to the death. We talked about that a little bit last week. That the reason for this tribulation period in the book of Revelation. By the way, the book of Revelation, right in the center of it, there's a number of chapters, 8 to 10, 12 chapters, that are strictly dedicated to this tribulation period. This Daniel's 70th week, this last seven years on earth as we know it. This tribulation period is a fight to the death between God and Lucifer. Revelation chapter 10 verse 6 says this, one mighty angel says, without further delay. This is when the action starts. Last week I had somebody ask me, Tom, we've been talking about Revelation, we talked about Daniel and Ezekiel, and people kept asking me, when are we going to kill somebody? Matter of fact, my man right back there texted me and said, uh, we didn't kill a whole lot of people today. Today we're going to do some killing, baby. <laughs> oh, you don't like that. I love, I love these scriptures. God doesn't him haul around. He engages the enemy quickly and begins to defeat the dragon, Lucifer, the devil, that old serpent. I want to give you an idea, real quick, a concept of how long God has been looking forward to kicking the devil's butt. Like forever, it's all he's ever got done thinking about. Look at these scriptures. These are the various names used for the tribulation period. Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, a time of distress, the great day, the hour of testing, the indignation, the great tribulation, and the day of the Lord. All these prophets and these scriptures refer to when Jesus comes back to this earth and starts mopping up the kitchen with the devil's head. Oh, it's good. I know you're not, you're not real excited just yet, but you're going to be in a moment. The next slide, Miss Olivia says, and, oh, I, what I did was this week I finally made a mistake just to try to relate with some of you. So the specific references is supposed to read specific references <laughs> to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord refers to the tribulation period. Look at how many times through Scripture God is looking forward to winning. Now let's stop there, and it really doesn't matter if I go much further because this is important for us to understand. God always wins. He always does. He always has. He always will. Whatever you're facing in this life right here, right now, in this moment, God is going to win out. Is there going to be trials? Yes. Tribulation? Yes. We're talking about the tribulation. And there's lots going on. But in the end, God wins. So much so he's been looking forward to it since the day he created earth. The next slide we want to show you is the biblical references to the Antichrist. I taught you how to say revelation. Now you got to say Antichrist. 
That's how you guys say. A little growl helps out too. The little horn. These are the names of the Antichrist. A fierce looking king. A master of intrigue. The ruler who will come. The contemptible, which means hateful person. A shepherd who will not care. A worthless shepherd, man of lawlessness, the lawless one, the rider on the white horse, and the beast. These are all names for the Antichrist. This Antichrist is going to be instrumental throughout the book of Revelation and in this last seven-year period. Next slide we want to show you. Now we start the seven seals. And stay right there, Miss Olivia. There are these things called the seven seals. Say seven seals. There are these things called the seven trumpets. Say trumpets. There are these things called the seven bowls. Say bowls. All right. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are all about God raining down fire, hail, plague, and all kinds of wild and craziness on this planet against the evil one. Against the Antichrist, against Lucifer. Now listen closely, whether you agree or disagree, but against those who damn his name. Now we're getting somewhere. I've been leading up telling you that God is looking forward to kicking some butt. And it's about time, because in Revelation chapter 10, the writer says, Without further delay, baby, you can count on it. It is coming down the pike like an avalanche. Right here, the seven seals open up. Now, the apostle John, he's got to write and, and he's got to say things like, like, or looks like, or, or it's supposed, supposedly, or words. He cannot even put into the language that he was writing in of what these things actually look like. But the Antichrist appears with the first of the seven seals. Great warfare erupts. There's famine. There's plague. There's, the Christians are martyred. There's an earthquake. And there's an astronomical wackoness that takes place during these seven seals. These are found in Revelation chapter 6 through 8. Olivia has the next slide for us. The seven trumpets. In Revelation chapter 8 through 9, you can read about the seven trumpets. Hail and fire destroy the plant life on planet earth. One third of the sea and one third of the ships are destroyed. Poisoning of one third of all fresh water. Many die. Darkening of the sun and moon. The first woe, the fifth trumpet is demonic locusts. Now this is super cool reading. We'll stop right there. Super cool reading. The Bible says these demonic locusts are going to appear out of nowhere. And they're going to be by the billions. They're going to have hair long like a woman. They're going to have a, a battle garb on them like a battle horse. And they're going to go around and they're going to sting everybody that doesn't believe in Jesus. I can't be the only one that finds excitement in that. Puts a smile on my face. You know, I'm trying to have some fun here. The, all the enemy ever gets done doing is punching you in the mouth. And when God reacts, you all sit there like, oh, really? Far out, dude. Revelation is no joke. And it's actually crazy. Oh, what God would bring that kind of torment on the planet. The kind of God that has been pushed too far. People that are damning his name. That they're calling good bad. And they're calling bad good. And they're screwing everything up. And he's had it. He's had it. And he comes up with all these wild and crazy things. Earthquakes. Hailstones the size of 100 pound boulders falling to earth. Squishing people's guts out that don't believe in him. I love it. It's the funnest reading in the whole Bible. Revelation. <laughs> the third one was the seventh trump. Ooh, look, look, look. We got to go to the seventh or the sixth trumpet. This demonic army kills one-third of humanity. The third woe, the seventh trumpet, voices from heaven declare, the Messiah's kingdom will reign forever. Now just picture in your brain, hail, fire, 
plagues, killing, armies versus armies, nuclear attacks and all kinds of craziness. And then for a moment, everything stops and there's voices from heaven that say, the Messiah's kingdom will reign forever. The seven, uh, the seven, whatever they are coming up next, the seven bowls, Revelation 11 through 16. <laughs> God puts sores on all humanity. The death of whatever is left over in the sea. <laughs> Rivers turn to blood. Now understand what's happened here with the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. The enemy right here and right now in your life and in my life, he's running rampant. He wants to get a grip of that brain of yours, and he wants you to think things that are not good, not positive. He wants you to make good, bad, and bad good. He wants you to screw up all the theology that he's ever tried to put in, that God has ever tried to put in place. He wants you to think that there is no God at all whatsoever. The enemy is after you. And when the tribulation hits, the enemy is going to be more than just this subtle persecution that you're experiencing here in Revelation or here in America. But there's going to be this worldwide persecution where Christians in the first set of the seven, uh, the seven seals, where Christians are actually going to die, I believe, on American soil because of this tribulation. It's not going to be some sort of fancy little cute little world that we live in like we do now because God is going to come back and he's going to retake this world for himself. And in order to do so, he's got to burn out and kill off all sin and damnation or hell or whatever the devil has planned for you. He's got to root it out. Now watch, super cool stuff. Great darkness falls over all the earth. The intensification of sores. The Antichrist armies advance to Armageddon. Ooh, that's a fun word to say. Say Armageddon. And there's this devastating earthquake with these 100-pound hailstorms. Now, we're going to hang out right here for just a moment. Revelation chapter 11 through 16. And in chapter 16... There's this war going to be going on called Armageddon. You know why? Because of all the things that God is doing, all that he is uh, proclaiming, all the angels' announcements, all the war, all the famine, all the death is against the enemy. The enemy, Lucifer, the Antichrist, gathers up all of the nations because the Antichrist and the devil have had it. So they perform signs and miracles and wonders, the Bible says, and they gather up all the kingdoms of the world and they bring them to this ancient place called Armageddon. It's super cool stuff. Miss Olivia has a picture of Armageddon. This I find super cool in, in, uh, in trivia for you. Did you know that Armageddon really is an ancient city? Did you know that cu uh, cultures and people have come and gone so much from this plateau right here that it is 26 layers deep worth of geological digging or whatever you call it. It takes 26 layers to get down to the very first of the foundations of this little tiny city in northern Israel. And you know what I think is so super Super cool. The city has been preserved for the day of Armageddon. Possibly, I'm not saying that this is exactly true and what's going to happen because Armageddon could be just a, a place that's going to be on the earth somewhere. But your international, say international, you're going to love this. Interla international, what are we going to call them? Geological, say geological. geological. Know it alls. <laughs> Have made this spot right here. An international, untouchable place in the history of the world. It's on the International Historic Heritage Place. <laughs> and I was reading, and I thought to myself, here's this city, this culture that's dead and gone. But the world is preserving it. For what? Armageddon. Where were we, Olivia? Chapter 11. Oh, there we are. <laughs> the armies will be gathered by the Antichrist. They're going to come to Armageddon. God is going to destroy all the armies on the entire planet. And for the second time, say second time, in the history of the world, you will hear these words come from heaven. 
it is finished. When God comes back and smites the enemy off of this planet. Before we get there, super cool reading right in the middle of Revelation chapter 11. Miss Olivia, take us to Revelation chapter 11. I want you to see this and hear this story. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. You see this kingdom that, is, that we live in right now, this United States or this planet? This is that we live under the rule. Listen closely. This is undeniable. We live under the rule of the prince of the air, under Satan's dominion. But as we've been talking about in the last couple few weeks, God is coming back. He's going to deal with the prince of this air. He's going to deal with the devil. He's going to deal with the Antichrist. And there's going to be a proclamation from heaven that says, uh, he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. Who is he? God Almighty. Look at this in chapter 11. I'm going to tell you the story. We'll be done shortly, or at least by three. There are these two witnesses, say two witnesses. They appear out of nowhere in the middle of chapter, or in the middle of Revelation in chapter 11. They appear as two witnesses that are olive trees. These are the two olive trees that stand right beside the God of the whole earth. They have the ability, listen close, they have the ability while they're preaching during the first part of this tribulation period, during the first 1260 days, three and a half years, they have the ability to not only preach and teach the gospel, but they have the ability to call down fire on anybody that's not listening or sleeping in church. They have the ability to cast plagues. They have the ability to call down hail and fire. Kind of reminds you of Elijah back in 2 Kings chapter 1. They have the ability to really cause chaos on this earth for God's good. See, the enemy is all about setting up his kingdoms. The enemy is all about cult worship. Jesus Christ is all about freedom for those who call on his name. These two witnesses are calling out freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Listen to all. Listen all who will hear that there is salvation to be had from Jesus Christ. The kingdoms of this earth, the antichrist, the devil, they're going to be, they're upset, they're angry at these two witnesses. And I don't know why some bad things happen, but how many of you know bad things happen? All of a sudden, out of the deep, far recesses of the abyss, the devil comes. And he kills the two witnesses. Right in the middle of chapter 11, the book of Revelation, the two witnesses are dead. They were the only hope this world had. And the devil comes and he kills them dead, dead, dead. One day passes, two days pass, three days passes. And guess what? The Bible says the breath of life came in through those two witnesses. <laughs> they took a breath. They were alive again. They began to preach and teach again. And then from heaven again, there's this loud sound that says, boys, Come on up here. And the Bible says that everybody and every tongue and every tribe and every nation will have seen their dead bodies in the middle of Jerusalem. So much so that the world is going to rejoice. So much so that they're going to create an international holiday. And actually give each other gifts because of these two witnesses that have been proclaiming the name of Jesus are now dead. The world is actually happy about that. Do you wonder why God gets so upset during the book of Revelation? Now, now what the world has seen as dead, God brings back to life and the whole world sees life. And the whole world sees these two witnesses right in the middle of chapter 11, the book of Revelation, as they go up to heaven. And the Bible says every tongue confesses the glory of the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. An amazing thing. These two olive trees. They date back as far as Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 4. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 4 
that Zerubbabel, who was like a governor, and Joshua, who was a priest, not Joshua and Caleb, another Joshua, he was priest at the time. These two began building the new temple. It's called the second temple. You see, Solomon built the first temple. It was destroyed. Now Israel's dispersed all over the planet. But now there's this, these exiles that are coming back to Jerusalem. And they begin building a temple. How many of you in your spiritual life, spiritual walk, you felt like... Uh, you can't see God, you can't feel God, you just, you've just you been out in the middle of a desert, and things are all wild and chaotic and chaos, and you cannot get your grip even on reality. And I've been there in my life where I could not even get a grip on what reality was. The Israelites were facing this because they took two years to build the slab of this new temple. And the Bible says, as Zechariah is prophesying, Zechariah, he, he's seeing a vision and in this vision, he sees two olive trees. And he's praying and he's interceding. And he says, dear God, who are these two olive trees? And God Almighty makes this statement. He says, these are the two who stand right beside me. And I am the God of the whole earth. You might remember this scripture out of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. You see, Zerubbabel and Joshua, at the time of the rebuilding of the temple, they did not enjoy all the miracles, all the shock and all like the patriarchs did in years past. They felt alone. There was pressure coming from the outside to stop building the temple. From the enemy. There was pressure from the inside because apathy took over. If you've got apathy in your life this morning, apathy toward Jesus or, or any, kind, uh, any kind of Christian, or, uh, um, Christian faith, Jesus-like lethargy in your life. Let it be this morning. Be like Miss Molly who shared this morning who became intentional this year about serving Jesus Christ. Because at the end of this life, now listen. Listen, at the, at, the, at the end of this life, it's, it's just us and Jesus. Nothing else. No church buildings, no pews, no nothing else. It's us and Jesus. And victory. Say victory. And victory. Zerubbabel and Joshua, they couldn't see victory. They lost hope. They lost vision. And then God makes this powerful statement. He said, it's all right, man. I understand that right now I'm ministering different than I did back in the old days. But make no mistake about it. You will accomplish building this new temple not by your own might, not by your own power, not by your own vision, not by your own skill set. But I will establish my kingdom and it's going to last forever. And that temple has got to be built. And I'm using you to build it. You are the olive trees. Now, thousands of years later, you see this come up again in Revelation chapter 11. These two olive trees are back, baby. And they stand beside the God of the whole earth. And he means business. And he's come back to fight for you and for me. So that we can be done with this enemy. You see, these two witnesses died true. They were dead, dead, dead. Like that other guy we know. His name is Jesus. He was dead, dead, dead. But what? God brought him back to life, life, life. If you're in the sanctuary this morning, or you're listening online and you feel part dead, or all dead, you don't know which way is up, if you're coming or going, the enemy has attacked you from the outside, and now on the inside you're an emotional wreck. Recognizing your life. That God ministers differently all the time, but it's still not by our might, not by our power. It's by His Spirit, says the Lord. And at the end of the day, at the end of this life, at the end of this tri uh, tribulation period, Miss Olivia wants to take us to Revelation chapter 22. Is the coolest stuff in the history of the world. Then the, this is the very last chapter of the very last book of the Bible. This is what we're fighting for. This is what we strive for. 
The Bible says, Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. You remember when you remember when Adam and Eve were on earth, they were not allowed to eat of the tree of life. Now God is saying, now it's yours, it's all yours. God is, in a sense, creating Eden all over again. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. God is constantly showing His mercy and His love and His grace. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in it. And His servants will worship Him. They will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And what? You and I, they. Remember, we've repeated this earlier. They will reign forever and ever and ever. You. You, the church. Because Christ's kingdom will never end. It's the only kingdom that's never going to end. He's the only king that's going to go undefeated for eternity. Think about that. And those who are with him, those who have confessed with their mouth and believe in their heart. That's what the Bible says. I'm not saying that this morning. I'm just simply repeating what the Bible says. In this life, look, the enemy throws all kinds of things at us. Tries to distract us. We talked before that. Most Christians don't even crack open the book of Revelation because it seems too difficult or different things. Look, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible where Jesus Christ is standing right over top of the altar according to Revelation. And it's the only book in the entire Bible that says if you read these words aloud, you will be blessed. And if you hear these words and apply them to your life and believe in Jesus Christ... You will be blessed. I say, let's take a look at what Revelation has for us. The prophecies, the good news, the victories, the fun and excitement. So all the enemy ever gets done is punching you in the mouth. Let's go read some good stuff about when God punches the enemy in the mouth. Would you please stand with me this morning? Larry and Jane, would you please join me? Pastor Libby, would you please join me? And stand right here in the middle. Larry and Jane, if you would stand right here. Pastor Libby, stand right there. Mom, you can join Pastor Libby if you like. These are my friends. They're just going to pray for you if you need anything at all. They're not going to get in your business. They're just going to say a prayer of blessing over you. Show some kindness and some love. Today, if you'd like to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, if that's you today, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. I need you. Help me. Lead me. Guide me. Forgive me of my sins. Anoint me. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer, you are bought by the Lamb of God, bought by His bloodshed. That means that you are saved. That means... That now you are Jesus and he is yours. That means one day you're going to be able to float down the middle of this new great city spoken of in Revelation chapter 22. When everything else has passed, you see Jesus says, I make all things new. And that's where we're headed. This morning, take full advantage of the presence of God Almighty in this place and in your heart and in your mind. He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. Be intentional this morning about your life in Jesus and having Him as your Savior and your guide.